Have you ever heard of the word Armageddon? I will say that in most religious circles, this one, this is one of the favorite topics of the Bible. And it's found in, book, in the book of Revelation, chapter 16, verses 13 through 16. It is this direct passage right here where we are given and introduced to this fascinating word called Armageddon. Now, the reason why I bring this lesson up for tonight is because uh, I've been dealing with a lot of uh, individuals who uh, see the things that are going on in the world. Uh, they see all the destruction, the utter chaos, uh, uh, the wars that are taking place, uh, a lot of uh, bigotry and prejudice. And they somehow assume to think that we are living in the time of Revelation where we are facing this battle Armageddon. So far we've already got riots that are taking place, we got destruction, we got hatred, and just so much things that are just going on. We have a, a pandemic of a virus that is just hitting across the entire world. And they come to be believe and think that we are living in the time of Revelation and we are facing the battle of Armageddon. Or they would indicate and assume that the Battle of Armageddon is actually close. They believe that this is going to be a literal battle where it's going to come and take place, where God is going to send his angels and there's going to be a, a big war, a big uh, battle that's going on in the air that we're all going to see. But folks, when we turn our attention to what John is talking about in the book of Revelation chapter 16, yes, this word Armageddon, it's a fascinating word. We get excited when we want to talk about it. Movies have been produced, Hollywood movies have been produced, portraying what the Battle of Armageddon is going to look like. But folks, we have to ask ourselves the question, if we truly want to believe the Word of God and for what it truly is, being fully inspired by God Himself, God breathed Scripture, we need to understand what the context of what John is talking about. We need to ask ourselves the question, saying that, what does it mean to the readers of the first century? What did it mean to them when John was writing Revelation chapter 16, verse 13 through 16? Yes, the word Armageddon, it is a fascinating word that we read about in Revelation chapter 16. But folks, if we want to be honest students of God's word, then we need to take for what it says. We need to look at the context. What does the context mean by this battle of Armageddon that John is seeing? Well, first we need to have an understanding of what it meant to the first century Christians at that time. Because if this was going to be a literal battle that's going to take 2,020 years in the future, then what would it have meant to the original audience? So think about it like this. John is writing this in the year 96 AD. And he's saying, oh, this is just going to be a great big battle that's going to take place in 2020. So you have nothing to concern yourself uh, with. They'll be confused and be like, okay, well then what did it mean for us? What's the point? So folks, it had to have meant something to the original audience. But that doesn't mean that it can mean something for us today in the sense of, okay, how does it apply for us today? Well, in order for us to be able to have a good and accurate application when it comes to rightly dividing the Word of God, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, we need to first understand what does it say, what does it mean, then how does it apply. When we have the correct meaning of it, then we'll have the correct application of Revelation chapter 16, verse 13 through 16. This is where we are introduced to this exciting word, Armageddon. In northern Palestine, between the Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean Sea, three mountains are located. On the coast of the Mediterranean Sea is Mount Carmel. Now this is the mountain that is best remembered from the Old Testament as the mountain in which Elijah had the contest with the, prophet, with the 450 prophets of Baal and was victorious. But not far from Mount Carmel extends a second mountain known as Mount Tabor and a third mountain known to be Mount Geboa. These three mountains form a triangle in northern Palestine. Running between these mountains, between this triangle, is the Valley of Jezreel. And within the Valley of Je Jezreel, there an ancient city called Megiddo once stood. 
Near that city is a little mountain called Mount Megiddo, or Armageddon. From this area in Palestine, we get the word in our study here in Revelation chapter 16, verse 13 through 16. Now, what's interesting is that the word Armageddon in the Greek means Mount Megiddo. The Greek word for mountain was Har, which is the A and the R for Armageddon. The A and the R is the Greek word for mountain. And then Megiddo, or Megiddon, was the name of the town. That's what Armageddon means. Mount Megiddon, or Megiddo, to be accurately to accurately pronounce it. Throughout all the years, Mount Megiddo, and we'll look at examples from the Old Testament that we'll bring to light, Mount Megiddo is known to be a battlefield area. It was a battlefield area that was very familiar with the Jews. Now bear in mind that when we read about the descriptions of Revelation chapter 16, verse 13 through 16, keep in mind that the book of Revelation is Jewish apocalyptic literature. None of it's supposed to be taken literally. In Jewish apocalyptic literature, things were symbolical. The Jews loved referring to numbers and symbols in apocalyptic literature. They were fascinating with it. So that was how John was writing the book of Revelation. It's a Jewish apocalyptic literature. So yes, the battle that we're going to be seeing here, the descriptions that John is going to provide in this battlefield area is need to be taken symbolically because it's Jewish apocalyptic literature. And so without a doubt, a great deal of interest exists in Armageddon or Mount Megiddo in this battlefield area. So what does the Bible teach about this important word? Well, what it teaches and what we learn here for this lesson tonight of Revelation chapter 16, verse 13 through 16, is the fact that God always wins. This is the reason of why John is providing this description of this battlefield area or this gathering to assemble for a great big battle at Armageddon, is to tell us that God always wins. Folks, that is the main idea for our lesson tonight, is that God always wins. He always wins. And I'd like for us to look at uh, two features from the text. Feature number one is that I want us to dig deep into the vision. Number one, I want us to dig deep into the vision. What did John see in his vision? Well, let's go ahead and read our text. Revelation chapter 16, beginning at verse 13. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are demonic spirits, performing signs, who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, Here's the God speaking. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon, or accurately pronounced in Greek, Har-mageddon, Mount Megiddo. So John saw a few things here in his vision. Number one, he saw something like frogs. First thing that he noticed here in his vision is that he saw something like frogs. Verse 13, he says, Out of, and I saw out of the mouth of the dragon, beast, false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. Now he identifies these unclean spirits as, identifies these frogs as being unclean spirits or demonic spirits. So did John really see frogs? Were these literal frogs that he saw? No. He tells us right here that he saw unclean spirits that looked like frogs. They were like frogs, like or as, using as a metaphor, a symbol, or a simile 
Remember, the book of Revelation, Jewish apocalyptic literature, it is never meant to be taken literally, but only symbolically. So, to begin his vision, he saw three demonic or unclean spirits like frogs. Another thing that he saw in his vision is that he saw the dragon. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon. Now bear in mind that this is the same dragon that John saw earlier in chapter 12. Chapter 12, if you read the entire chapter, he has seen a vision between the woman and the dragon. And this is the same dragon that he is referring to here in chapter 16, verse 13. This dragon, he identifies as being the ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan. Chapter 12, verse 9. This is who the dragon represented. It represented that ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan. Satan is the leader of the spiritual forces of evil, and he is ferocious like a dragon. A ferocious dragon is what Satan is depicted as. Also within his vision, he sees beasts. He says, I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Again, this is the same beast that John saw earlier in chapter 13. He sees two beasts, as a matter of fact. One known as the sea beast, chapter 13, verse 1 through 10. And then verse 11 through 18, the land beast. Now the sea beast that he sees in verse 1 through 10 of chapter 13 symbolized the civil persecution from the Roman Empire. That is what the sea beast represented when you read the descriptions that John gives in chapter 13, verse 1 through 10. It is referring to the civil persecution from the Roman government. The land beast that he sees in verse 11 through 18 of chapter 13 symbolized the religious persecution from the Roman Empire. The land beast was also used by Satan to encourage people to worship the human government, the government of Rome, to worship the Roman emperor, when you go back and read verse 11 through 18 of chapter 13. But here, in chapter 16, verse 13, he is not called the land beast, but the false prophet. A prophet is one who speaks for another. If one speaks for God, he is a true prophet. If he speaks for someone else, then he is a false prophet. So what John sees here in chapter 16, verse 13, is exactly what he saw in chapter 12 and 13. The dragon being Satan, the sea beast being the beast here in chapter 16, verse 13, and the land beast being the false prophet, because the land beast was represented symbolically as the religious persecution from the Roman Empire. It encouraged the people to worship the human government, the Roman Emperor. The Roman Empire, with an official edict, persecuted the church of the first century. So here is a lesson for us today that we can learn from this vision, is that Satan used human government in the first century to oppose the cause of Christ. If Satan could do that then, then what makes us think that he cannot do that today? If Satan was able to get into the minds and into the hearts and into the lives of the human government, no matter what form of government you have, whether if it's democracy, republic, um, dictatorship, communism, socialism, whatever form of government you have, Satan can always find a way to enter into the hearts, into the lives of the human government and try to do whatever power it is that he can to be able to, through the human government, to damage and to hurt the cause of Christ. Now, why does Satan do this? Well, it's because he knows that he has been defeated. In the vision of chapter 12, you'll see the fact that the woman representing the uh, virgin mother Mary and the child 
that she gave birth to, being Jesus Christ, defeated the dragon. Chapter 12, verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness, to the place where she is to be nourished for a time, and times, and a half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with the flood. But the earth came to help the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Folks, what John is talking about here, he is talking about the woman and her child's victory over the dragon. See, Satan tried to kill Jesus while he was a baby. Go back and read the gospel accounts. Go back and read Matthew's account where Mary had to scurry off and to run and hiding away out of Bethlehem, out of Nazareth, and into a different region. Why? Because Herod at that time was furious and he wanted to kill all male babies. That was Satan using the human government to try to put an end to the child. That is what John is talking about here. But now seeing that the earth came to her, to her help, that Jesus fulfilled his ministry, that he died on the cross, and that he conquered death and defeated death and was raised on the third day, which is the first day of the week on a Sunday, Satan was defeated. Death could not conquer Jesus. Jesus conquered death. Jesus won. God always wins. And Satan was defeated. And because Satan was defeated, he was angry, he was mad, he was fuming, he decides to make war on the rest of her offspring. That is the church. That is the church. Since he know that he's lost, he's now going to attack the church. Those who keep the commandments and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So therefore, at this time in 96 AD, he is using the Roman government to try to persecute, use civil persecution and religious persecution against the church of the first century. Why? Because Satan's raging war against them. Folks, again, that is the lesson for us today that we can learn from this vision, is the fact that if he, Satan, was able to use the human government to destroy, to try to make war with the church, what makes us think that he cannot use human government today? We have many of our brothers and sisters over in China and over in Asia and other parts of around the world who are having to meet and worship in hiding in secret. Why? Because they're facing persecution from the human government. And we pray for those brothers and sisters that are out there those who may have been tuning in from afar off, if you are facing persecution from your government because of your faith, I encourage you to keep on keeping on, brother. Keep on keeping on, sister. Keep the faith always. Don't let Satan win. This is what Satan is trying to do. Don't let him win. Stay faithful to Jesus. Why? Because he always wins. You have already won the victory. And so keep the faith always. God always wins. Folks, notice verse 14 of Revelation chapter 16. For they are demonic spirits, performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world, to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. So these unclean or demonic spirits represent the spiritual forces of evil. These forces of evil go out and gather all the ungodly nations and allies that were aligned with the Roman Empire. What's the point? The point here is that Rome would not go down without a fight. Now, was John concerned about a physical fight? No. 
He has already said that it was a spiritual fight. Thus, it is a spiritual battle, a spiritual struggle between the cause of evil and the cause of Christ. Revelation is about the conflict between truth and error, God and Satan, right and wrong. Folks, that is what the vision that has been given to John here means. Now, folks, the second future I want us to look at is the victory. We discovered and we looked at what John saw in his vision. I would now like to turn our attention to the victory. Look at verse 15. God is speaking here. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake who keeps his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. Folks, the victory that we have is what God has approved. The victory that we have is what God has approved. Okay, what do you mean by that, Corey? Well, let's look at what God approves here in verse 15. First off, he says, Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed. Folks, keep in mind about that word blessed. How many times have I said this? And I may sound like a broken record, but the word blessed does not mean happiness. Folks, remember, keep in mind the church of the first century was facing Roman persecution and religious persecution for their faith. They were dying for the cause of Christ. What do they have to be happy about? Nothing. They've been feeling miserable. He's been taking their rights to, uh, to trade in the marketplaces. He's trying to attack them by making sure that they will never eat again by marking them with the mark of the Roman Emperor, 666. If you did not have it on your hand or on your forehead, then guess what? You couldn't make any trades. You couldn't buy anything in the marketplace. Those who bore the Roman Emperor's number, 666, indicated that they had worshipped the emperor, they claim Caesar as God, they renounced their Christian faith, and so that will enable them to continue on their businesses in the Roman Empire. But if you were not marked with the Roman emperor's number, you cannot buy food, you cannot do any business in the marketplace, you cannot um, uh, uh, be able to have any kind of utilities whatsoever. Basically, he is trying to starve them out. The Roman emperor is trying to starve the Christians out. Folks, this is what they're facing. And if what they're facing, what do they have to be happy about? Nothing. So what does the word blessed mean? The word blessed in the Greek simply means that which God approves. Makarios is that Greek word, that which God approves. And folks, we all want to be approved by God, do we not? Well then, if we want to be approved by God, we need to what? Stay awake, he says. God approves the one who stays awake. Now this word stay awake means to be watchful and alert at all times. God approves the one who is always watchful, who is always alert at all times. Interestingly, the word also means to stay alive. That's interesting. It also can be used to represent one that stays alive. God approves the one who stays alive. Now again, staying alive physically? No. Because remember, John is already talking about spiritual things here. It is the one who stays alive spiritually one who stays faithful spiritually in the context when god is coming like a thief in the night he is saying that i approve the ones who had remained faithful i approve the ones who have stayed alive spiritually who have been watchful and awake in the context the ones who are watchful alert and spiritually alive are those who are in the church God's destruction upon the Roman Empire will be like a thief in the night. He is telling the Christians that when the time comes, you do not want to be found ashamed 
as a result of your being on the wrong side. And folks, when he says, I'm coming like a thief, not necessarily referring to Judgment Day. In the context, he's referring to coming like a thief when he comes to destroy Rome. God, who has absolute authority, can use nations as their tools to conquer other nations. And in the year, I believe, 426 or 476, one of the two, A.D., the Roman Empire finally fallen. The Roman Empire was conquered and destroyed, and they were not expecting it. It was the least expected time when that was going to happen. And so God, in 96 A.D., was warning the Christians, informing them, saying that when that time comes, you do not want to be found on the wrong side. Make sure that you are still alive, spiritually and faithfully, that you are still alert and watchful. So God approves those who stay awake spiritually, those who stay awake faithfully. God approves the one also who keeps his garments on, the text says. God approves the one who keeps his garments on. Folks, the church is pictured as those who have washed their garments and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Chapter 7, verse 14. The church is pictured as conquerors who have been clothed in white garments and, the, and whose names are written in the book of life. Chapter 3, verse 5. John saw the church, the people of God, coming down from heaven, dressed as a bride in white linen, adorned for her husband. Chapter 19, verse 6 through 8. There in that passage of chapter 19, verse 6 through 8, John says this linen, this pure white linen, is the righteousness of the saints. The church is the people. God's people are clothed in pure white linen, which is righteousness. And folks, we have no righteousness of our own. How did we get this righteousness? When we put on this white, pure, pure white garment, this pure white linen, how did we get that righteousness? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, Paul tells us that Christ is our righteousness. If the church is clothed in righteousness, she is clothed with Christ. So now the question is, how does one clothe himself with Christ? Well, when you read Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 and 27, there's the answer. For you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as been baptized into Christ, here it is, have put on Christ. Folks, when we have put Christ on from baptism, He, being our righteousness, clothed us with His righteousness. Folks, baptism does not make us righteous. Christ makes us righteous when a man obeys the command to repent and be baptized, to have his sins washed away, to have his garment to be clean and pure and whitened by his blood, and to have his righteousness. Folks, when we look at Revelation chapter 16, verse 13 through 16, we see that this great battle assembly is meeting at the place that is in Hebrew called Armageddon, verse 16. So what does this battle mean? What does the battle mean? Well, first off, when we look at this battle place of Armageddon, we read that it has a tragic history. There's a tragic history about Armageddon, or Mount Megiddo. And in this tragic history, it includes the fact that on Mount Geboa, Saul, King Saul, fell on his own sword and killed himself when he was defeated by the Philistines. It was tragic because it was in the Valley of Jezreel, the good King Josiah, king of Judah, went out to interfere 
with the invasion of the Egyptians as they passed through his land on their way to Assyria. Josiah had no right to be in that battle. He had no right to interfere, yet he did it anyway. And what happened? I encourage you to go back into the scriptures, into the book of Kings, and discover what had happened when Josiah interfered in a battle where it was none of his business whatsoever. And that took place in the valley of Jezreel. And this area all surrounds Megiddo and Mount Megiddo. It has tragic history, but folks, also, Mount Megiddo had good history. In the days of the judges, it was in the area of Megiddo that God gave that marvelous victory to Gideon, who had only 300 men and put to flight the armies of the Midianites. God gave him the victory. It was the area of Megiddo that God gave the victory to Deborah, the woman judge, and her ill-equipped army. God gave her the victory. Folks, do you see the pattern in history? What is the meaning of Armageddon that John is trying to give to his readers and to us today? Here is the meaning. God gives the victory. He is telling the Jews in Revelation 16, verse 13 through 16, that, hey, you are familiar with Armageddon? You know the good history that takes place there? What happened? Well, the pattern shows that God gave all of his people the victory in Megiddo. So what is God going to do for you against your plight in Rome and the persecution that you're facing? God's going to give you the victory. That is the meaning. That is the message that he is wanting us to know, is that God gives the victory. Out of a hopeless situation, he gives the victory. Such is the history of Megiddo. The Battle of Armageddon, folks, is not a physical war on a plain 10 miles from Nazareth. It's not a physical war that's going to come down, land in the United States of America, or in Europe, or in Germany, or in Russia. It's all going to take place there. That's not what it's about. It is not to be confined to one person, or a group of people, or a group of nations. Folks, it is a spiritual conflict between right and wrong, truth and error. It is a spiritual battle that you and I face each and every day. Folks, the battle of Armageddon, how does it apply to us? It applies to us of our spiritual battle against Satan and the forces of evil each and every day. Folks, God always wins. This evening we looked at two futures from Revelation chapter 16, verse 13 through 16. We looked at the vision we looked at what the description that John gave in his vision and what the meaning of these visions, what it meant to the original writers. And then we looked at the victory. The victory that we had, that they had against the Roman Empire, against the, uh, the spiritual forces of evil through the Roman Empire. And it gives us the meaning today that it is our spiritual battle that we face. And as long as we continue to fight the battle for God each and every day, remain faithful, stay awake, keep our garments on, remaining faithful to God and in our spiritual battle that we face, we are going to be victorious. The battle of Armageddon is a spiritual battle that every person is called upon to fight. Adam fought it. And lost it in the Garden of Eden. Jesus fought it in the Garden of Gethsemane and won. You and I are fighting on a daily basis. The prospects for our winning this battle are wonderfully great. For God says, we receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 28. Folks, the battle of Armageddon is a decision. You and I are called upon to make a decision to either be for or against God. And when we make the decision to be for God, we are going to win the battle. God always wins. If you will, 
bow your heads in prayer with me, and the lesson is yours. Heavenly Father, we come before you just thanking you for this opportunity that we have of being able to dive into your word, to dive into the book of Revelation, which for some may be a, mis uh, a mystery, may be hard to understand, but folks, when, but when we allow the context to determine its meaning, it brings out so much clarity and so much simple and understanding. We know that there's no physical battle of Armageddon that's going to happen sometime in the future. It's not to be taken literally, but Father, we are facing, we are fighting our spiritual battle of Armageddon right now against good, or excuse me, against evil, against error, against Im immorality. We face those things each and every day. It is a battle of good and evil, truth and error, God and Satan. And it's a battle where we have to make a decision. And we want to stand by you, God. So what we ask is that you give us the strength, the power that can so abundantly enrich us to give us the steadfastness that we need, to give us the patience that we need to endure the sufferings that we face each and every day of our life. We know at times we make mistakes because we're not perfect. And when we make those mistakes, Father, we come to you and we ask and beg of your forgiveness. We beg of your forgiveness. And we ask that you give us the strength to pick ourselves back up, to pick up our sword, to pick up our shield, to pick up our spiritual armor that you have given us, and to keep fighting and to keep battling against the temptations, against the evil forces of this world. We know that in the end, we will win. We have already won. And we long for you to come and to return to take us home with you in heaven for all eternity. And Father, as we wait for that time, we're going to remain spiritually alive, spiritually awake. We're going to be watchful and alert. We're going to keep on our garments. Keep on the blood of Christ that continually cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And we're going to keep fighting the good fight until we finish our race. Just as your great Apostle Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. We too would like to pronounce and loudly proclaim those wonderful words when our time comes. For this we pray through your Son's most holy and righteous name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you all have a blessed evening. And if you all need me whatsoever, please feel free to get in touch with me, to call me, to text me if any of you need anything. I love each and every one of you so much. Thank you and have a blessed night.